So we've got to the point where we need to ask, what is psychology a science of, given our obvious difficulties in identifying what a what we might consider a mind to be, and also the diversity of the goals which the broader enterprise of psychology is concerned with. And we identified experience and behavior as the principal concerns of the emerging discipline. So let's have a look at just at some landmarks then in the 19th century, which is when this first becomes possible. So we have advances in biology and physiology, um, new nerves have been found to transmit electrical signals. Von Helmholtz first measured the speed of neural signal transmission in 1849. So this is getting sciency. Of course, the relationship to nerves of, to any, of nerves to any psychological concern remains to be worked out. Um, in 1860, Gustav Fechner published the Elemente der Psychophysik, or Elements of Psychophysics, which tried to put a scientific frame on the business of sensation, seeking to quantitatively relate things we can actually measure to sensations which we can't measure directly. Now, psychophysics is one of the first things we'll look at. It's a very interesting, if somewhat perplexing, field. And it's unlike many of the early approaches to psychology, it is an enterprise that persists today. The first experimental laboratory was set up in 1879 by Wilhelm Wundt. At the same time, the Virgin Mary was appearing in Nock, County Mayo. And the first textbook on psychology was written by William James in America. The Principles of Psychology, a huge work, um, which combines an awful lot of different uh, approaches and questions. Let's have a look at William James. He's one of the principal founding figures here. Um, lived from 1842 to 1910, came from a very remarkable family. His brother, Henry James, was a very, very famous novelist. And William James, in his writing gave us some terms that have stuck. Um, he particularly the idea of a stream of consciousness. So consciousness is a word, as we'll see, that's very, very difficult to pin down. And in this famous passage, he says, consciousness does not appear to itself chopped up in bits. It flows. A river or a stream are the metaphors by which it is most naturally described. In talking of it hereafter, let us call it the stream of thought, of consciousness or of subjective life. And for James, this stream of consciousness was the ultimate fact for psychology. So he wasn't nearly as interested in behavior and learning and such like many classical concerns of psychology. He was interested in the experiential side. And notice how similar the language here is to the vision of Heraclitus that we met earlier on, who Heraclitus famously said, we never step into the same river twice because everything's changing all the time. This is true when we come to consider the locus of individual experience. Now, the stream of consciousness is a very powerful metaphor, and it entered our language. We use it, um, but it had a greater effect in the domain of literature than it did in the domain of scientific psychology. So Henry James and other novelists of the time belong to what is called the modernist tradition. And when you read a modernist novel, you find yourself inside the heads of the characters. Dostoevsky is another good one to mention here. If you've ever read Crime and Punishment, you are tortured by being inside the head of an axe murderer for most of the novel. If you read Joyce, you get inside Bloom's head, inside Stephen Dedalus's head. You hear the voices, you hear internal dialogues with all their meanderings. Virginia Woolf's novels, likewise. This was not possible before this point in time. If you read earlier novels by George Eliot or Dickens, they do not have this character. William James's strong interest in experience led him to write another very influential book, The Varieties of Religious Experience. And this is a very important moment because, remember, the discipline of psychology does not, has not yet been institutionalized and so on. William James has opted to look at the experiential side of, of, of these questions, and he recognizes that there's a great deal of expertise in other traditions beyond the Western scientific traditions, which, as we've noted, have been cooked entirely in a Christian cauldron. 
Um, he recognized that in Buddhist and Hindu traditions there were uh, there are real philosophies, real philosophies that have addressed such questions that go back two thousand years and more. Um, firmly empiricist, very relevant to the concerns that he was beginning to address. And so he displayed a cultural sensitivity that these questions which we're asking need to be understood in a cultural context, um, which is a very important lesson for us to learn today. And with regard to the many metaphysical problems that we've encountered, he preferred not to sweat it too much, I think quite wisely. He was one of the founders of the School of American Pragmatism, along with John Dewey and Charles Sanders Peirce. And the sort of way a pragmatist approaches a problem is not to figure out first principles, but to see what to do about it. So if you have an idea or a position or a theory, the question of the pragmatist is, is that any use? And it's with this that the self-help tradition in popular psychology originates as well. And the scientific and self-help angles have never got disentangled since. So, we don't, we're only a, doing a quick guided tour here. So, what do you do if you're trying to find, found a scientific discipline with such ill-formed questions? Well, the answer is you do anything you can think of. So, a lot of thinking was done in armchairs. Decisions made, categories invented uh, without any particular contact with the natural sciences. That still goes on today. We mentioned the domain of psychophysics, which we're going to have a look at now. But we'll see also that there was uh, an experimental flavor to the air. Experimental science was now in its heyday. And there's no end to the amount of clever experiments you can think up. And topics like hypnosis, which were very sexy at the time. And we'll pay particular attention also to the idea that you might yourself report on what's going on in your mind, a problem that arose. So I'm going to illustrate, if the technology works, um, what the business of psychophysics is about. We mentioned that it was an attempt to relate things we can measure to things we can only report on. Now, we measure physical properties of sounds and light, for example. Um, but those measurements are only indirectly relevant to how we uh, encounter sounds and life and light as thinking, feeling, perceiving beings. Um, we know, for example, that let's take sound as our example. We know that sounds of different frequencies are heard as different pitches. So there's a relationship between what we can measure, which is frequency, and what we can report on, which is pitch. So we can report that sounds higher than that tone. That sounds twice as high as that tone. These are judgments we can make as subjects. And so we can do experiments um, in which we carefully construct physical stimuli with known properties and play them to people and ask what do you hear? And um, here's an example, for example, of a sound with a measurable frequency of 200 hertz, 200 cycles per second. Now, what happens if we add 100 to that? Let's go with 300 cycles, cycles per second. It's a higher note. I think you'll agree it's higher. So we, we're already uncovering the relationship between pitch and frequency. How much higher is it? If you're a musician, you'll recognize that as a perfect fifth, like from C to G on the piano. Um, if, we go to, if we add another 100 to 400 hertz, that sound is an octave above the first sound we played. And on a piano keyboard, an octave is a fixed interval, a fixed distance. And we can go up by octaves. So... 400 is 200 hertz more than where we set out from. But we find that we have to actually double the frequency each time in order to move the same distance up the piano keyboard, in order to move the same perceptual distance. So the next octave occurs at 800 hertz, and then 1600 hertz. And from these kinds of experiments, we can learn what the reliable uh, property, 
properties of the reports are, how they relate to the frequencies that we've carefully measured and prepared. Um, the reason we're going to such difficulty is that the study of sensation can only be done by asking people. We have nothing in the world that allows us to measure pitch or allows us to measure any of the other psychological properties, but they are related to physical properties. So the methods involved here involve very complicated and somewhat tedious experiments in which you carefully prepare stimuli, ask people, do these sound the same or not? You find just noticeable differences and try to relate those to underlying physical quantities. You give people knobs and allow them to adjust things until they appear to be equal or one appears to be twice as high, loud, bright as something else. And we can do this in a variety of domains. We just use pitch and frequency as our first example. So there on the left side are some things we can measure. We can measure the frequency of sound and we can relate it to pitch. We can measure the amplitude of sound. That's a good physical quantity in concern with the amount of energy that is moving the air molecules. And it's related to loudness, but not in a simple way. And we have nothing in the world that can measure loudness. We can only ask people, how loud does this sound to you? Those two examples are from sound. We can move to the measurement of luminosity, which is the amount of light emitted by a source, and we can relate that to what people report, which is a measure of brightness. We can go into a completely different domain. We could ask about the composition of fine French wines. We can measure the chemicals in them, so we have some measurable index of what's in the wine. And we can relate these to questions about scent and taste. And we could see, for example, our people's judgment of um, the character of the wine, the length of the aftertaste, the complexity, the tannins, the berry notes, all those things that wine connoisseurs talk about, are they actually related to the physical or chemical content of the wine? Turns out they're not particularly. It's, there's as much marketing as chemistry in wine. Uh, we can move into a completely different domain of touch, and we can measure the pressure that we apply, and we can ask, what do you perceive? Um, we can ask different questions. We can ask, if I place two needles close together in your hands, do you perceive one object or do you perceive two? So this is um, a sensible scientific undertaking, but it contains a little bit of a perplexity because we're not sure what, we're, what the mapping is that we're uncovering. You see, physics has a good solid foundation. But the things that we're... On the other side, those perceived properties still remain somewhat mysterious. And it almost looks a little bit as if we were doing a science of the cogito or of the transcendental subject. Um, so psychophysics, because of its firm experimental foundation, has never gone away since the 1860s, unlike pretty much every other aspect of the origins of psychology. But it never freed itself from the conundrums of cognitive science. It's unclear whether we're establishing a mapping between two distinct domains or what exactly is going on when we are forced, for one side of the mapping, to simply ask people. People respond to questions, but within that framework, there's lots of unstated assumptions about the nature of the subject who's asking those questions. How alert should you be, for example? Um, should you have eaten that morning? Um, who are you? Are you intimidated by the experimenter? All these will affect the person who's giving the responses. They don't affect the measurements of the physical properties. So that's psychophysics, and we'll carry on.